morning, fellow humanists. My name is Todd Kimball. It's an honor to be your MC on this frigid day in Portland, Oregon. We have Humanism is a rational philosophy informed by science, inspired by art, and motivated by compassion. It advocates the extension of participatory democracy and the expansion of an open society standing for human rights and social justice. Our reader this morning is doing double duty. She also serves as our president. Please welcome the lovely and talented Anne Henderson, possibly joined by her dogs in the background. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I, I, have a, I have a reading. It's very short, but uh, uh, it, it may be a little, uh, uh, well, I'll just read it. Why did God create atheists? There's a famous story told in Hasidic li literature that addresses this very question. The master teaches the student that God created everything in the world to be appreciated since everything is here to teach us a lesson. One clever student asks, what lesson can we learn from atheists? Why did God create them? The master responds, God created atheists to teach us the most important lesson of them all, the lesson of true compassion. You see, when an atheist performs an act of charity, visits someone who is sick, helps someone in need, and cares for the world, he is not doing so because of some religious teaching. He does not believe that God commanded him to perform this act. In fact, he does not believe in God at all. So his acts are based on an inner sense of morality and look at the kindness he can bestow upon others simply because he feels it to be right this means the master contends that when someone reaches out to you for help you should never say i pray that god will help you instead for the moment you should become an atheist imagine that there is no god yay and say i will help you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Very thoughtful and kind reading this morning. And HGP's own Jerry Dickinson started studying art after retiring in 2002. In 2007, he began painting. He is a member of the monthly artist critique group that started in 2008. His studio is part of the Falcon Art community of artists and musicians. The Oregon Society of Artists has acknowledged Jerry's works with their People's Choice Awards that he received in their inaugural event. OHSU has three of Jerry's works in their permanent collection. Let's have a very warm, yet extremely muted welcome for HGP's own Jerry Dickinson. I appreciate that uh, uh, introduction. Nice to see all of you on the Zoom call today. My studio is in the... Uh, Falcon Art community. So um, I'm writing this as if I'm introducing you to this guy named Jerry. So welcome. These are my paintings. I'm in my studio here. Okay, Jerry retired in 2002, as Todd mentioned. And I, I came to Portland in 2007 because of family and the birth of first grandchild. And um, my pursuit of uh, painting began out of curiosity of the things that I don't know and, and my capacities because I've retired. I want to do something different. Um, so the curiosity prompted a lifelong learning in the art and literature, particularly in art. That's been my passion, although I didn't really participate in it in any way until uh, 2007. Here is my granddaughter's. The one on the right was the one that was born that caused us all to come to Portland. Gee whiz, this is a little fast here. The painting in behind is um, a painting that got uh, um, juried in to the Pittick Mansion um, exhibit uh, about eight or nine years ago. The painting that was uh, juried in to the Pittick Mansion uh, exhibit uh, and the theme was uh, the work of the Willamette River. And a particular painting was called um, Grain for the World, because this is where they're loading up the, the, the wheat to ship off 
to Southeast Asia, as I think, as I recall. So I began my exploration of art through drawing. I thought that that was the first place I should start. T.S. Eliot once wrote, old men ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving into another intensity. And I felt this passionately that I was time, it was time for me to start exploring and finding out who I am. I'm retired. I've moved out of the East Coast. I have a whole new identity here on the West Coast. So here's uh, the beginning of my drawings. I did a self-portrait. Uh, this is a picture of what it looked like outside of my apartment in the, in, um, in Portland. And a drawing was foundation for all uh, Jerry's art. And he, and he draws for the challenge of seeing. What was important to me at this time was that I had eye-hand coordination, that I could actually draw what it was that I saw if you'll see on the on the the drawing on the left is a drawing I did on Whidbey Island when I visited Robert and Patty. Um, the one on the right is uh, the ballet slippers of uh, Candace Bouchard. I, I took some drawing classes, studio live drawing classes, and here's the uh, the result of that. And then I got interested in charcoal as well. So here are a couple of charcoal pointing. I did a copy of a Michelangelo uh, small drawing, but it was his study for the Sistine Chapel and that's in the upper right-hand corner. Yeah. I had an appointment at uh, OHSU one morning in January and I came out of the elevator at the, at the building of health and healing down below near the waterfront. And I took a photograph, it blew me away. But I also sat down and did a drawing at the time. I had some a quick sketch and that's on the left. And because of the intensity of the light and, and the, um, the darks and the light together, I thought this might make a good watercolor. So the watercolor on the right is a result of the, of the drawing on the left. And this watercolor got juried into the Northwest Society of Artists in Seattle. So the drawing led to uh, oil painting. I felt comfortable enough to leave drawing and go and experiment in a new medium. And so I chose watercolor, but I mean, I chose uh, oil painting because it's so forgiving. You know, you can just splash stuff on and wipe it off and, and you can play around in it. But you know, I took up the oil painting because there's a lot of problem solving going on. You know, what what are you gonna do? How are you gonna, how much paint are you gonna put on? What brush are you gonna use? I mean, there's just, and what are you gonna do to make things work on the canvas? So, but my, my issue was here, not to be precise as I was in drawing, but to show intent and spontaneity. That's what I wanted to capture in oil painting. So here I am down, I'm, I'm tent camping down on the Crooked River, south of Prineville. And this is my setup on the left here. And I'm painting the chimney rock. But you know, chimney rock wasn't the focus of the painting, as you can see. I was overwhelmed by the colors I saw during the day. And believe it or not, I really did see that mauve kind of um, lilac color coming out of that valley. And so that's what I was trying to capture in this painting and the movement of the water as well. All right, moving right along. So my drawing led to, oh, I, I went backwards. Okay, let's see where we're going. Well, now why are we doing this? Okay, here we go. Um, so intent, my intent can, uh, is an experiment. This has a mind of its own. It's taken off without my doing anything. Um, Intent can be an experiment in the composition, how I'm going to lay the painting out or the exploration of the colors that I use or the brush strokes to imply move, uh, mode or uh, mood or uh, movement. 
Here's an example of brush strokes and mood. This is an early dawn at the um, Salmon River Estuary. This is uh, just south of Sitka uh, Art uh, Colony in, on the coast. So you can see how um, I tried to capture here the, 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 the moon still uh, in, still up, hadn't set yet. Just the feeling of the place, it was cold. So that's how I was using uh, the, uh, I don't know, the characteristics of oil painting, the, the thickness of the paint, the, the brush strokes, et cetera, et cetera. So here I'm out at um, Hood River and uh, at this barbecue place just north of uh, Hood River on some uh, offshoot road. I don't remember exactly where. And I'm oil, and I'm, uh, all of this is plain air. I plane outside. I carry all of my equipment out and paint most of the time. Here I am. I'd never painted a truck before. And I thought, you know, here's a perfect opportunity. So I set up and I'm painting this truck. And the woman comes out and gets in. She starts to drive away and I wave at her. And I, I quickly leave my easel and I came up and I said, ma'am, I'm not finished with the painting yet. She said, what painting? And I said, I'm over there painting this truck. She said, you better not be painting my truck. And I said, no, I'm painting a picture of the truck. I'm not planning to paint your truck. She said, oh, okay. And I said, can you wait a little bit? She said, no, I have to go. And I said, well, how much is the truck? I'll buy it. She said, it's not for sale. And I joked with her about that. And so she said, of course, she said, I'll give you five minutes. I said, okay. So I quickly made some notes to myself. It took a couple of pictures because I hadn't had a picture of it yet. And so she, uh, uh, I said, okay. And she took off. So I finished this one in the studio. <clears throat> I try not to allow the intent to overwhelm the process. In other words, I don't want to be so focused on capturing a likeness that I lose the process of what I'm into. And, and I also want that spontaneity to come out. I want the freshness of the spontaneity to, to overpower me in a way and take control of my hand. But um, you have to have that balance between what you want to happen and then yet the freedom to allow to what happened happen. So here I'm out at, uh, at uh, Newport painting. Um, I'm, I'm with my uh, younger son and he takes a picture of me painting out here on the, uh, uh, the Yaquinta Bay there. And that's the lighthouse, the old Yaquinta lighthouse up in the, uh, in the painting, you can see it there. As I'm finishing up on this painting, my son comes up and he said, Dad, do you realize that the painting is in perfectly aligned with what the landscape is? So if you look at the painting on the easel, you see the far horizon line is in line with the same with the rocks on the left and you go to the right, you see the rocks in the painting and then it comes right out. That just was a fluke, I, and maybe it's the accuracy of my eye that I was able to do that, I'm not sure. But um, if you note, when I got home, I had to do more to it. This was, a, this was a little, the painting was too cold. It needed to be warmed up. So in the studio, the painting on the right is the final painting. I darkened the shadows under the rocks, I lightened the tops of the rocks. You can compare those. I warmed up the far side of the channel there, the rock, because I felt like that needed to be warmed up. And also brought some warmth to that okra color in the foreground. You know, the, the point of a painting is to make it work because no one's ever gonna see this site again. And if I went back, it's not going to be the same either. So it's the painting itself that has to have a life that stands alone from anything else that happens. 
And every artist looks at something and says, you know, make it work, whatever it does to make it work. If it's not reality, whatever it does to make it work, do it. So this Jerry, is a good example. Jerry, in fact, right. that's a beautiful triptych. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. So now, um, thus outside of the general idea of the intent, I want this, the situation I found myself in at any moment to inform the work, to inform myself. What is it that uh, that Jerry's thinking, doing, and doing at the moment? This is a mindset that you have to fall into. This is out on Sylvie Island, the far end. There's a wildlife uh, um, station there for uh, for bird watching, and I'm out there painting. Although I'm not in the the, the shelter itself, I'm out on the ground in front of it. And as I'm setting up, you see the tree in the painting on the left. You see how bright that solo tree is, that, that single tree? Well, if in, in the photo, you can barely faint that there's some light back there, lighter section. At one point, the sun hit that, and it was a beacon. I couldn't believe it. I quickly took my brush, and I painted it in while the light was still on it. And then I built the painting around that particular scene. The painting's as long as you see on the easel in the lower right-hand corner, but I propped it off in order to get all three of these pieces on this on this slide. The other thing that, if you look at the uh, the painting on the easel, the foreground of the far shore there is kind of flat and drab, and I thought, what am I going to do with that? And the trees are kind of sparse and, and uh, kind of dull. So all of a sudden I find out that I need to work on my trees. So I splash some, some uh, dab really with my brush. And then I go back and I put the gray in to create sky holes through the trees because you can see beyond that. Now a secret in art is anytime you want somebody to look through like trees or shrubs or you make that color a little lighter than the background that it's reflecting in. So it brings attention that there is actually space in and among those branches. But then what was I gonna do with that foreground? I grabbed my knife and I love painting with a flat uh, knife. It's just fat. And I've got about a dozen of them of different shapes and sizes. And I take and make three marks on that background. This top, right where the the okra uh, blends next to the real dark edge of the trees, that's one stroke from left to right. And then I take my uh, other uh, knife. It's a different knife, and I make a, a vertical slash, a wide. Uh, stripe that drops down from the uh well kind of don't have a uh, it drops down from the you see the two trees underneath the two trees is a bit of a, a lighter uh, okra and then i have another knife that i use that i start from the left and i make that chevron looking with a you see the thickness of the paint it's got an edge to it on the top that's one stroke with the knife. It's one and done. You can't go over that. You mess it up. You lose the freshness of it. Now, sure, you can wipe the whole thing clean and start, and some people do that. But you got to take risks. You got to take, you got to be willing to say, okay, I need to do this. I need to do that. Or what if, what if I did this? Or what did I do? So anyway, this is just to show you my palette. Um, where I'm at, and all the time I'm out there thinking, I don't even know where I am in the world because it just doesn't matter. I'm in such isolation and I'm in my head in such a way that I begin thinking about process, 
And it's just amazing the resources that you come up with in yourself in problem solving in some of these uh, some of these uh, paintings that you do. Here's a funny story. Here, the this is an Ona beach um, on the coast, and it's across the road where the Beaver River flows into the Ona Beach uh, State Park region. And it's a beautiful little spot. And there are some actual uh, water lilies that are in bloom. There's some yellow in there if you can see them up close. But I'm I'm painting, and a car comes up, and rolls his window down. And the guy said, hey, buddy, <clears throat> I'm lost. Can you, can, can you, oh, sorry. Let's go. Can you give me some directions? I, 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 I'm lost. And I turn around and I said, you know what? I'm lost too. I'm, I can't, know, I don't know where to go in this painting. He laughed and said, well, and he got out of his car out of curiosity and he came over. We had a nice chat. And uh, I said, would you take uh, my picture with my phone? And he said, sure. So that's how I got this photograph. I don't know if he ever found his way. And I'm not quite sure I found my way, but here you go. <laughs> this is out in the Steens. This is um, my, um, my partner and I were, were camping at um, uh, Fish Lake up in the... Um, we're at about uh, 7,000 feet here. And the photo at the top on the right, you can see the, the, uh, the moon has risen and it's getting dark, but it's still light. I mean, light enough because it's nothing out there is creating any shade. And um, I tried to do this painting based on, and I'm doing this painting on the left based on the photo on the right. But the photo below is my setup. I'm painting in the same spot, but if you look, I don't know if your portraits are hiding. I don't know if I can slide that picture, but our photographs of us are covering part of the photograph in the painting. But what is on my easel is that other crop that's behind the photograph. I mean, that's in the far distance of the photograph. I don't, on my screen, all of your pictures are covering it. Um, but as it got darker that day that I was painting this, I was able to put some more dark reds uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, rose matter in, into, the, into, the, uh, into the painting and also the brush marks. I just felt like it was so raw and rough out there that I was very free with how I made these brush marks. And there's some, there's some uh, paint knives. Did you see the, the thin uh, brushes in the, in the shrub, in the branches? Uh, they're just edges of paint knives going in different directions. Well, for watercolor, actually, I got stumped. I had an exhibit and went back into the studio, an exhibit of, of oil paintings. I went back into the studio and I couldn't, I couldn't paint. I got frustrated and I thought, what's going on? And as I start reading, I'm a big reader and I love to read biographies of, of artists. And one artist is telling another, you need to get this is sunshine. Why don't you go down to the Mediterranean and take your watercolors and to give yourself a break. And I thought, watercolor? Maybe I should try some watercolor. So that's when I dropped oil painting and got into watercolor. Well, let me tell you, oil painting is so forgiving. You can just wipe it away. You can make brush and it takes days to dry. So you can go back tomorrow and do something with it. Well, that's not the case with, with watercolor. You make a plan of four or five steps like you would in playing chess. And um, the opponent is the group of variables, you know, how wet the paper is, the texture of the paper, the transparency of the paint, the viscosity of the pigment, and the brushes you're using and the tools, other tools. Well, they take their turns in moving. 
So I'm making a decision about something, but this variable may take over what my decision was. If I lay some paint down on and the wet paper is too wet, it bleeds. It just goes on and on. So I can't control that except the, I can maybe control the, the wetness of the paper, but then something else needs to be controlled. So you try to grow, control one thing and something else pops up. So it's really a, a very intense, unforgiving um, uh, medium. So here is, um, I'm down at the waterfront in front of the old town tower. And all I could see was the cherry blossoms. This really took my breath. Now, you know, they're not that intense. They're a very light, lovely pink. They're not this hot. This is hot pink. In fact, it's called opera pink. It's just got so much drama in it. And, uh, but that was the intent. I wanted to capture the intent of I felt in this particular watercolor. Oh, by the way, um, uh, Oregon Society, I'm sorry, the OHSU owns this painting. It's in their permanent collection. So watercolor is willful, as you can imagine by my description. And so, uh, and I'm dependent on the coincidence of variables in the painting process. And before I know it, uh, I don't know what my move is. And consequently, the outcome is completely unpredictable. So you just go with it. You just learn to, okay, so that bled, oh, that's too wet, oh, that's too orange, or that's too green, or that's too blank, or whatever either throw the painting away or you accept what you're given and work with it. And here's the painting from a photograph on the right. This is up in Elk Meadow on uh, Mount Hood. And these are huckleberry bushes in the fall. And it's a gorgeous color. And I'm a hiking buddy and myself, um, he's a photographer. So he had taken these pictures and, and had given this to me. And I wanted to do a watercolor of it. So I did the watercolor back in the studio and you see the watercolor on the left. And my first movement on the watercolor was to put the trees in, except you don't put white in. You have to paint around to keep the white. White is the thing that you, I mean, you can buy white pigment, but a purist in watercolor will leave what they want light. So you paint from dark to light very often in watercolor. And sometimes you can go back and forth, but you keep the white as your lightest point. So I'm I'm doing that with this. And I'm as I'm working across the top of the painting, I'm realizing if I do the whole painting, I'm building a barrier across the painting and it'll, it, it'll look flat and it won't give the eye a chance to escape. So this last tree on the right, I leave. And that one does have some color in it, so I can get some variation in in the tones there. So I don't know what to do with the upper right-hand corner. I just leave it. And I go back, and of course, over here on the left, that evergreen that you can see, that place, I just left blank and later put in that evergreen. Sorry, let me go back to this. And then I started painting the huckleberry bushes. And the paint the here, is very wet and I hold it up so it can drip. So you see all of the okra color is the drip and it's to represent the, the grasses that are so tall. So then I had this square in the upper right hand corner. I thought, we got to work this out. What am I going to do? And of course I'm in the mountains. So I said, just, just throw some mountains in there. And that's exactly what I did. So all that upper hand corner is just totally fabricated what I thought was necessary to make the painting work. This is the hiking buddy that's a photographer. And on that same trip, we're having a campfire. We're sleeping in this meadow. And he sets his camera up to take this photograph of us sitting in front of the fireplace. And I thought, I'm going to make a watercolor of that. Whoop. Sorry. Up. Uh, yeah, so this is a color of us. I mean, this is the painting of us sitting in front of the fireplace that, that we had built. And again, um, you just, 
uh, well, it is what it is. The the, the uh, no more. No, I'll leave it as that. We'll go on to the next slide here. This buddy, uh, we're hiking buddies, and so we're, we're up in uh, Vancouver Island. That's where he lives, and so we're out hiking to Mount Edward uh, Island, uh, uh, Mount Edward, Albert Edward. And I'm taking my, I've taken my watercolors. So here I am painting, and this ridge that you see above my head, if you go to the right, it continues up that watercolor. It goes way up. If you follow the line from the photograph to the to the watercolor. Now I'm back in the still life, I mean, uh, life uh, drawing. And um, this time I'm taking my watercolors with me, not my pencils or charcoal. And I'm painting live models. And this is risky because as you know, watercolor is, uh, is very willful. So you're not sure what you're gonna get. And so I had to be really super careful. But I was real happy how these two, uh, uh, watercolors came out that day. So sometimes the painting or that I, you know, I win in this chess game that we're using as, a, as an analogy here. And sometimes the process does me in. However, after each game, uh, I'm usually the winner because I'm learning something every time I take chances. It inspires me to say, oh my goodness, look what can happen. This is a watercolor that was done in the studio, but that night was the night the lights came on in Manhattan. I'm down in Washington Square after Hurricane Sandy hit in Manhattan. We're walking in the dark and all of a sudden the lights come on. Now these people have been out of light for about three days. And so you can tell who was home when the lights went off from my, <laughs> from my photograph. Here's another watercolor. Whoops, sorry, doggone it. This is, uh, my older son had taken me for a three day canoe trip down the, uh, the Deschutes river and it was a fabulous trip it was absolutely incredible and our first night we camped in this section of the river and that was his canoe and i almost put the canoe in the i was going to save it for the last to put it in and then i just couldn't i didn't have the heart to do it and i thought well i'll save that for another painting but i i never got to the other painting sorry but anyway this is um this was the experience of that trip, which was an amazing um, uh, canoe trip. I got into doing some oil portraits. And so these were two uh, portraits that came out that I was pleased with. And I named the one on the left, Mary Magdalene. And the one on the right is Jesus. So I thought humanists would appreciate this couple. Here again is an example of what does an artist decide to put in, take out? How does he make the painting or she make the painting work? I'm out at Toledo. I'm in, I'm at Oregon. I'm in at Newport, but I don't want to paint anymore on the media coast. And I go into Toledo, the little town, the lumber town there, a quaint little village. It's beautiful. And you can see in the upper right hand corner where I've set up and I'm painting the painting that's ending up on the left. By the time I'm ready to leave, there's a kayak class going on and they show up in the middle of my painting now they didn't ask permission to be there but that's okay let that be and i thought i gotta take a picture of this because maybe i'll want to put them in well here take a look at the photo and you see how much is there and when you're at this distance from what you see that my 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 easel is quite a ways away from the 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 buildings at the far end. So what I'm seeing is basically what you see in this painting. And I don't see all the detail. 
and I just simplify it. Now here's, um, this is a, um, a vineyard uh, just south of Oregon City and it's called Villa Catalana. And they saw my watercolors and asked if they could use them to the labels for their uh, wine bottles, which they did. This was in 2012. So they have eight or 10 uh, watercolors and they use those watercolors for their, for their labels. And it's consistent like the Pinot Gris is always the same painting, but they change the year every year. So um, I was familiar with the grounds. And then I go back and paint occasionally. So I'm back painting after I know the place fairly well. And th in the meantime, um, Merle is the fellow, is Cindy and Merle Mosel is the are the owners. He had built his gazebo. Whoops, sorry. Uh, he had built this gazebo and this little uh, porch-like thing over the water in this painting. And I painted it. but And also it was smoky because of the fires. It, 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 the smoke was almost hurting our eyes at some point. Um, but I, I painted this, and after I got it home, I didn't like it. I thought that the gazebo was, I don't know, too busy. It just made me feel like that it was too much going on in this painting for my for, for me. I didn't, it just felt crowded. So back in the studio, I took the gazebo out. And I just, I made the water line to the right a little further out and I darkened the sky and heightened the blue smoke in the in the in the trees. For some reason it feels more comfortable, it more at ease, more peaceful, and it's not so damn busy as it was before. So this is how it is today. <clears throat> Here's an interesting story. I'm always you know, trespassing most of the time where I'm painting. You know, I don't ask permission. But I'll go, and so I'm I'm at the rail yard near um, Holgate and about between around 11th Avenue. And I climb up on this dock over here on the right, and I'm painting away. And this guy in a hard hat comes walking toward me. And I thought, shit, he's going to tell me to leave I'm I'm trespassing so he walks up to the dock and he says are you an artist and I said yes I am how did you know he said well we saw you painting and the guys sent me back here to talk to you and I thought and I said do I need permission to be here he said no you're fine he said we just want to know if we can move the cars because we're ready to fill the next car. And I said, oh, you don't want to move the train? Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, I tell you what, look at this painting. I think I've got enough going here. I'll take a picture and I'll finish it up in the studio and you guys can get on with your work. And I said, but would you take a picture of me painting? He said, oh, sure. So he's the one who took this photograph. And soon as he took it, I took a picture of the of the of the trains and then finished the painting in the studio. But I thought it was awfully nice. They didn't want to move Earth, you know. They allowed me to dictate the regulations of the of the train schedule there. Here's another painting that uh, was done at sunrise on just very close to uh, uh, St. Helens community. And uh, this is the guy that uh, bought the painting. I just, and what you see in the painting wasn't, well, I finished some of this in the studio because it was so bright. And when the light changes so quickly, you have to decide what it is you want to anchor and then finish the, the rest at some other point. So in the studio, I filled in the shadows of the, bridge structure that's in the water.
This is uh, Mount Hood from uh, Washington side. The fellow that owns uh, the Falcon Elk community, the, the, it's a three-story building and the other, the top three floors are uh, residents. And uh, we're in the basement of that building, but he has this vineyard and he owns this vineyard and I went out to paint from the vineyard because he has this view of Mount Hood from Washington side, it's up on the Underwood Road. So the, the photo on the lower right was taken at the time that I was doing the painting. But shortly thereafter, this couple, they're both artists, they're both musicians, and they have studios in, and they got married uh, at this very site. And so uh, I just took a picture and added that to the, how beautiful this site is. I mean, it was a special background for their, uh, beautiful background for their wedding. Here I'm out at the coast again. This is the Seal Rocks, and this painting uh, was part of the uh, Oregon Society of Artists. This was their first annual plein air event, and uh, this particular painting won the People's Choice, so which is quite quite an honor. Most artists would. I mean, you get you have a first, second, and a third, and sometimes honorable mention, but those are all individuals making a decision about your work. But when you get People's Choice Award, that means everybody who attended and voted for that, that's, that's really special. Here I'm back at the Steens again. This is the uh, Blitzen River that's in the lower part of the Steens. And you see my... my uh, my setup is on the right and the painting down through the Blitzen River here. And again, you can't tell in this painting, but there's a bush off to the left in the photograph that was just ablaze with red leaves. And so I captured that in the painting. And then I, I livened up the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the water area and I was pretty bold with my brush marks here. Here I'm out in uh, Washington State, right across from Astoria at uh, the uh, Lewis and Clark uh, State Park. And this beach, uh, if you look at the photograph on the lower right, there's a beach here and it's called the Waikakee Beach. And of course it's a spoof off of, there's no way that you can have Waikakee weather in Washington. But anyway, um, so I've set up to paint, and there you see me painting. And this photographer, um, there was a there was a break in the weather; it had stopped raining, and I had gone for specifically to paint. And I'm camping out there, and finally it stopped raining. So I quickly go out because I know where I want to set up. And lo and behold, I'm painting, and this woman walks by, and she's got a whole cadre of cameras hanging around her neck, and. Uh, she said, do you mind if I take your photo? And I said, oh, not at all. And I said, would you mind using my, my phone and taking a picture of me? She said, sure. So she had taken this picture of me painting from this spot. And this is the, the, uh, the painting that, uh, that was finished from that. Here again, in most uh, oil paintings, understanding what it is that I'm experiencing as I create is an important. It's it, that... What, what am I feeling at the time? For example, back here, what's going on when I'm, when I'm painting? What do I feel? I feel damp, but what is it I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about? What is it I'm feeling? And I try to get out of my head, I mean, get out of painting and visualize what's going on mentally at the time that I'm painting. And when I do that, sometimes I realize I make marks that I have no notion that I'm making. And there's just some kind of a transference going on there that is surprising. And that's the spontaneous. And it's so spontaneous, I don't even know what's happening sometimes. And it's just, it's, it's, um, it's magical in some ways. So most oil paintings uh, understand, I, I, well, that's the experience. What's going on with me? 
what what am I experiencing? And quite honestly, it's the most spiritual experience you can have. You know, it just is amazing for me. And now music works that way for for a lot of musicians. Pete, I'm sure that that does for you. I mean, you're you get carried off into your music, especially jazz. You just give whatever it is. You just go with it. Here I'm at the coast again. I'm out at Seal Rock. And um, this is a painting I decided I wanted to do for my son and daughter-in-law to hang above their fireplace. So I'm working on this. And this is in the summertime. And this is what basically I finished the painting. I get home. I can't stand this painting in the sense that the right side is so out of balance. I wanted the bowl that the vision of the bowl, meaning the the, the left and the right have a balance on the sides. But somehow those trees, everything didn't work. And of course, the right-hand side was fictitious anyway. I was just putting that in. So I took it to my critique group and oh, they tore it apart. And I made notes with charcoal. I drew right over the top of it. And so I go back out after the critique group and I set up again. Now this is February. This picture here is in February. And I start painting again. And and finally I finish and this is the final product. So thank you for attending my presentation. And to summarize, why do I paint? It feeds my soul. It's just as simple as that. And remember, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Just as simple as that. And this is my younger son, Miles, and we paint a lot. So whenever he has time, he'll call. And you've met Miles because he's presented to uh, Humanists of Greater Portland through the um, um, mobile medics, the international mobile medics that that to respond to international uh, crises. And so he, uh, so anyway, so if you're, again, like if, if uh, remember that, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I love that presentation on so many levels. I love that you have this playfulness about you when you do your painting, but it's also very strategic and scientific as well. So. Uh, you have that beautiful balance, and I love uh, kind of your interaction each time with nature and humanity. Just a beautiful presentation, and I'm glad that we got to see uh, the visuals and just your stunning paintings and see this talent inside of you that we might not have known about otherwise. So thank you so much. I will start with the first question, and we'll wait for other questions to come in. We are veteran Zoom attendees now. We know how to do this. Either type your question in chat or type your name and we'll uh, unmute you and you can come on and ask your question. So you mentioned, Jerry, in the intro of your presentation that art had always been a passion of yours, but it seemed to me that you really didn't take it up until after you retired uh, and you know later in your life. So my question is, what was it like in your younger days? Was it just a repressed passion? Was it something you did as a small hobby? What, what was that like uh, before you really took it up after retiring? Ever since, um, ever since grade school, people kind of said, Jerry, can you do this? Meaning they wanted a drawing or an illustration or a poster. There's going to be a, 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 you know, a sock hop or there's going to be a, a, a bake sale. So I, I was sort of the go-to to make the posters for stuff. And I was always drawing. And all through my adult life, every year at Christmas, I would, would make a card. And it would be usually something I did during the summer vacation time. So it's always been there, except I just didn't feel like I could devote myself to it because I didn't see that it was going to be... Um, possible to, to make a living in art. So I didn't, uh, I didn't pursue it. And then when I retired, I just thought, okay. And I moved to the West Coast. I mean, there were so many options of why not, you know, why not do that? Why not explore? You know, what, 
what T.S. Eliot says, old men ought to be explorers. That's precisely what we should be doing. And women too, for that matter. Not just old men. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad you did because uh, you're incredibly talented and you've given a lot to society through your art. Let's go to our next question. Obviously via Zoom, uh, Anne Henderson has a question. Yeah, I wanted to know, Jerry, what was the time frame that you that between doing your uh, you know initially doing drawings and going into your oil paintings? What was that time frame like? And then also between oil paintings and watercolor. Drawing started actually when I lived in uh, in Victoria in British Columbia. When we 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 moved from the East Coast to um, Victoria in 2002. And while I was there, after being a tourist for a year or so, I thought, okay, it's time to settle down and start doing some work. And that's when I started drawing. I just went and bought a pad and some a pencil and started working. And then I met an artist who was teaching drawing. Uh, and so uh, he had a studio with about a, a dozen students. And so I joined that. And, so once a week, I'd go and draw, and then during the week, I'd just go out and be someplace and draw. Well, that went on for about a year, and then when in 2007, we came to Victoria. We moved to a place in the Pearl, and I, I'm a walker, and I'm out walking, and I walk across by um, uh, PNCA, and I thought, oh, I walked in, and I said, do you teach art? Do you have classes for non-matriculated students and they said sure we have a, a, a adult uh, program here meaning uh, you don't have to be matriculated uh, you can uh, take classes and i said well i'd like to do that so i started in in uh, fall of 2007 taking my first painting class okay, okay. the following semester in the spring of 2008, I took another one under a fellow by the name of Jeff Gunn. And he's been my painting man, a mentor all these years. And he just, um, well, it, it's just been incredible. And that particular group of students said, we have to stay together. We have learned how to critique each other's work. And yeah. so from 2008 until this day, we meet the first Tuesday, the second Tuesday of every month. And we bring our, and it doesn't matter if you don't have a painting to discuss because you have history with this group and you know how each of us paint. And so we're, we're in a position to say, what the hell are you thinking? Because we have such understanding of each other's work. And why would you, why would you go to be this modern? Or why would you change this or that or the other? So that went on. Well, um, so when I started painting at PNCA, I painted about two years and I had my first exhibit and Jeff Gunn was my mentor to help me figure out how to stage it and this, all of this. It was in a coffee shop. So, you know, how prestigious is that? Anyway, um, uh, it was a nice show and it, had, it was fun to do. And it was right after that I went back to the studio to paint again and I was totally drained. I had no motivation for anything. I go, what the hell's going on here? And that's when I was reading and began reading about other things. I mean, other artists and what do they do about, you know, like a writer's block. What happens when a writer has a writer's block? What's going on with that? And, uh, and then I thought, watercolor? Sure, why not? So I started exploring on my own. And there's a, a, a Eric Weingart is an artist up in, uh, on Long Beach Island at the far end near Oysterville. He's fabulous and he's international. And I mean, he's in our backyard. So I took some classes with him, uh, uh, workshops with him. But that went on for about three years. And then I went back to oil painting because I, I felt like it was, I don't know, it was time to go back to oil painting. Yeah. Whatever, whatever the spirit moves me. If I want to do a watercolor, do a watercolor. If I want to do oil, I do oil. A lot of it's dictated by the subject matter. Okay. Jerry, you. you are generating a lot of interest here. We have some hands up, which I'll get to momentarily, but I'm gonna start with a question in the chat from Jeff Strang. 
Jerry, what do you do with your works once they're finished? You know, there's an adage in the art world, or certainly among artists, that it's not really art until it's sold. So what sells, sells, and what doesn't, doesn't. And I have a pile of stuff, and whenever I stop painting, who knows what's going to happen. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I've got an inventory of stuff. We have uh, open studios twice a year, well, once a year. It may go twice a year, but we were closed down because of COVID for so long. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I have, probably a selling maybe five, six paintings a year, which is nice. Uh, I don't know that it pays for everything, but it, it, it's very flattering. It keeps me painting. So, yeah. Sounds great. And Jerry, I'm, I'm going to hold off on something I'll say at the end here, but I've got an idea for your, your storage problem here in a oh. bed. HGP may happen in May. So I hope you, uh, Stay on until the very end here. Uh, okay, bring it on, Todd. I, I was I was a bad teacher here this morning. I didn't see whose hand went up first, but uh, we're going to go with Jules. Uh, Jules, can you come on in and ask your question? All right, we, we may go to the next hand up here. I'll give uh, Jules five more seconds, and then we're going to go to uh, <laughs> Joyce with a question. I see Joyce's hand right in front of me here. Uh, Joyce, why don't you go ahead and we'll take Jules uh, at a later time here. Jerry, I loved your conclusion about not having fun. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. And I'd like you to expand a little bit on your definition of fun. I heard you talking about eye-hand coordination, about problem solving, about meeting people, and about a spiritual feeling of some sort. Would you expand on that definition, please? Joyce, you may, and, and the rest of you may or may not know, but I'm retired as a full professor of recreation and leisure studies. So I am an expert on the whole concept of leisure since Plato all the way to the present day. And I've prepared, my life has prepared me for this in this point. So. Ooh. I'm practicing what I've preached in the academic world to understand what it is, the spirituality of you as a person. And sure, I'm a humanist, I'm an atheist, but I'm still very, very spiritual, as I suspect all of you feel that you are. And so the notion of fun is what is it that lightens your soul? What is it that makes you smile? What is it that makes you happy? How is it? How do you interpret that in action? You know, if you know, it's reinforcement. You do it once, you want to do it again, or you don't want to do it again and move on to something else. You have you have this desire to I don't know, just you can choose to check out anytime you want, but life can be so good. And, you know, there's something around the next corner. I don't care how old you are. I'm 83 years old, and I feel like that I'm just a late bloomer, a late bloomer, and I'm just, I'm, I'm a ball of fire working my way through the rest of my life, however long that's going to be. I might get hit by a bus tomorrow, and that prompts me to do everything I can that I want to do today. So fun to me is when I'm relaxed and easy and feel the fullness of my life. That's, that's to me, is fun. I feel complete. I feel whole. And I can be tickled and laugh. I can be sad. I can be melancholy. All of those are human experiences that are just priceless. And being retired, you have a, tan, a, a chance to experience these. That's a beautiful answer, Jerry. And you're not going to get hit by a bus tomorrow. No one's going outside tomorrow. Well, that's true. You're true. You're right, Todd. Yeah. I see Jules right in front of me now with his hand up. Jules, are you ready with your question? Okay. So I am uh, assumed to be a 90-year-old uh, retired hematopathologist. I was a leukemia lymphoma doctor at the Health Sciences Center for 30 years. 
And then I went back to my clarinet, which was really my first love. And my immigrant mother, when I got a four-year scholarship, uh, and I, I wanted to go to uh, to school and study music, she said, okay, how are you going to get there? We're living in a ghetto in Brooklyn, New York. Who's going to feed you? And besides, you'll never feed your kids playing the clarinet. Just like what you said, you thought about art. Well, it's not going to get paid the bills, so I think I better move on to something else. Having said that, <clears throat> I have a uh, recital scheduled for May 15th. I, uh, I will be 90 uh, on uh, Chico de Mayo. Thank you. And that picture in the back here, which you can barely see, is me painted by an artist whose name uh, may not mean anything to you. He's gone now. Uh, Arnie Westerman. Do you know the name Arnie Westerman? Yes, I do. I met him. Right. Yep. Yep. Well, that's he. I was at, uh, playing at a recital. I don't know if you could see it. This picture right here. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was playing, and he took uh, my photograph, unbeknownst to me. Uh -huh. And I was ushering at the May, uh, at a concert, and he said, you know, I took a picture of you, and I made a painting of you. And uh, lo and behold, we got to know each other, and this is the actual painting my wife bought from him as a surprise. And he was, uh, he wrote a whole book on how to go about taking a picture and turning it into a painting. I don't know if you've seen those books. They're very, very informative. Okay, so to bring this whole thing home, you casually mentioned that the only time you can really be free in music, or mostly, is in jazz, and that's true. If you know how to ad-lib, you could be free. You can create melodies on the spot, as long as it's in the context of that harmonic mode key signature and all the the right uh, notes. But you can't do that in the classics. And I'm basically a classical clarinetist. So my model is not freeing myself. My model is emulating as close as I can the people who play that instrument as if they're singing. It's, a, it's an extension of their inner self. And the sound that they put out is still a clarinet sound, but there's an overtone that is personal. And somebody who knows that person will hear it. The average listener may not. But I devote a lot of time to making my sound palatable and pleasant to listen to. And I still practice every day, and I still look forward to performing. So everything you said today, I took into myself and your skills as an artist are unbelievable. My wife is an artist in her own way, but you're the other artist that I know is Sarkis. He lives in Eugene. You know Sarkis? Yes, I do. Well, look at what he does uh -huh. in, in the most, with watercolor. It's yes. light it's rough edged, it's colorful. And he also does uh, portraits uh, like you. Uh -huh. So Sarkis and I are in communication constantly because hey. I admire what he does. Okay, yeah. Jules, I'm letting you be a jazz musician this morning and your style of asking a good question. Uh, we don't often do this, but this is the spirit of uh, our art and uh, relaxation and freedom. But go ahead and get to your question. Oh, I did. I know. I made my comments more than my comments. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. We're going to move on to Suzanne, hopefully. I see her hand up, and she's yes. in the screen now. Suzanne, Hi, go ahead with your question. Hi there, Jerry. I loved, I loved all the locations because I felt so familiar with them. I have a, host, a house on the Oregon coast down in Lincoln City area, so I know Newport really well. And also Mount here. So it was so delightful to see um, those locations and how you were doing it. And that one question I have is about the South Jetty, where you were doing the one picture. Yes. And it was in, in the Aquina Bay there. 
and it had the picture of the lighthouse and a beautiful, oh, that was a gorgeous shot of the headland there. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, do you know where that painting is? It's in my living room. Uh -huh. Oh. Okay, well, that was that was maybe my overall question is, is that keeping track of where your paintings are, um, you must um, have a little catalog or a, a I, notebook of that. I, to be honest, I haven't. And uh, part of that is that if I become famous, I want somebody to have something to do. <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks, Jerry, very much. And Suzanne, thank you very much. Because Suzanne has offered me to stay at her place. And, and I've done that. I've gone and painted from her place. So in Lincoln City there. Thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome. We have Hank Rob with his hand up, although his hand disappeared. Hank, do you still have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I actually have two questions, so I'm going to uh, try to limit myself. Um, and the one I'm going to go with is you said after your first showing in the coffee shop that you were exhausted. And a little later, you were talking about what do you paint? And you said, I paint what the spirit moves me to paint. But after that exhibition, I had the sense you were saying the spirit wasn't moving me anymore. And I did something. I, I think you said you started reading something or something. So what was it that made that part of you that brings that energy? What what did you do to, to uh, kind of kickstart it again? Hank, when I finished the exhibit, this was a, a exhibit of about 25 paintings and I've had to get them all framed. Somehow or another, I felt like I had to do all that. And that was quite expensive. And I was totally depleted. I just thought I'd accomplished that. It was almost like I had nothing else to accomplish in my life. I had finished that big task. So I go in and I'm, and I'm in my studio and I want to paint. And I'm just sitting and I'm looking at things and I'm thinking, where am I going to go with this? Am I going to go out? Am I going to pick up and my my gear and go out? And I thought, I'll, I'll be I'll be stumped. I just didn't know. And of course, I'm like I said, I'm a reader. And this was something Pizarro said and because uh, the pointillism guy, Surratt, had died. And Sinjak and, and uh, uh, Surratt were good friends. They may have even been lovers. I'm not sure of that, but close to it. Surratt was just totally distraught about, I mean, Sinek was totally distraught about Surratt's death. And Pizarro said, you know what? You need to get your ass down on the Mediterranean and get some watercolor. Now, Sinek's an oil painter. Well, why in the hell should I get down the Mediterranean with watercolor? Well, it's light, it's sunny, it's bright, just go, get out and change the environment. And when I read that, I thought, you need a change. You need to change a venue. You need to change your medium. You just need change. And what is that change? And so I tackled that. And again, it's like T.S. Eliot. Oh, man, ought to be explorers. We should know no boundaries. And I'm sitting there at my, in my studio as a rocking chair that I use when I'm contemplating what I'm painting. And I'm thinking, but why not? Why not watercolor? I've been intimidated by watercolor ever since I was a kid. And I thought, this is the chance. Because I got out of myself, totally out of myself here, and got into something that was so new, I didn't even know which way to turn, basically. I knew how to hold a brush, but I didn't know what way to hold it in the sense of watercolor. And so I forgot about my stumpness. I forgot about my block because I was so busy learning something new. And I think that's what carried me through the transition, the realization of changing direction. I hope that kind of answered it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Hank, we have time this morning if you'd like to ask your second question. Uh, it has to do with uh, a painting isn't art until it's sold. So I have a question about what you and maybe some of your art group that you bring your art to to uh, to criticize and get information about. Uh, this fellow's a fly fishing nut. And so he spends a lot of time with his fly fishing buddies, but uh, he stops fishing and he paints. And he painted this uh, uh, picture of someone fishing in a river, but... Uh, <laughs> To kind of top it off, he painted a uh, medieval fool's cap on the fisherman, uh, kind of as a statement about the whole business. And um, I I went to look for the book, but I, I couldn't find it because it actually was turned into a book cover of his friend's book. But uh, someone walked into his uh, studio and said to him, you know, I'd buy that painting if it wasn't for that ridiculous hat. So he painted it out and sold the painting. And I wonder, what do you think? You know, an artist has got to do what an artist has got to do. What, if, it meant, if it meant selling that painting and it was important to him to sell the painting, well, of course you do that. <laughs> Did any of you see the movie about um, Turner, uh, the the, the uh, English uh, watercolor, and he was from the Academy, very, very well established painter of the Academy. He was doing abstract uh, watercolors before uh, Impressionist was even existing. He was doing these in the 1850s. If you saw that movie, you'll see where somebody made some joke about it, and needed a little red. And he just took his brush and he flipped the red in this huge, huge epic painting of a sea coast. Well, the spot of red went right smack in the middle of the water. And he said, now that's the left side buoy. I mean, it just, and that just, that scene in the movie, if you see that, it was like an accident and it was so funny. So, you know, and it sold then. I mean, it became famous because of that little flip of the brush. I don't know about what art is. People ask me, what's your favorite painting? And I'll say, how many kids do you have? And if they have kids, and, if, and if they say, oh, I got three. And I say, well, which one's your favorite? Oh, well, and I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> they all have meaning. They all are significant. Well, how much time do you spend in a painting? And I said, well, from when to when? From the moment I set up or from the moment I studied art? So how long does it take that there's no answer to that? There's, and believe me, there are paintings that I've done that I thought, okay. And by the way, I won't sign a painting unless it's done. If I'm, I'm not comfortable letting it go, I won't sign it yet. But if I feel comfortable with it, I'll sign it. But there are people who have come in and bought things that I, they'll say, will you sign it? Because it's in my studio, not signed, because I am i don't know if it's finished. And I said, this speaks to you? And they say, yeah, I have no idea what people want or what speaks to people in my art. And so it's not art, it's just a joke, you know? None of it. I mean, who determines what art is? I mean, it's just it's just a personal thing that you have to like, especially if you're going to part with some money. Well, you may have heard this before, but I'll just pass it along. I once heard someone say, if you want to insult an artist, ask what their art means. And if they want to insult you, they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, uh, I think I'll end with uh, with this next question here. Uh, I'd like to have a few extra minutes to check in with our members with the weather and some of the things people are going through. I think it's important that we check in with each other as a group. So I'll end with this question. I'm sure there's people out there in the Zoom audience thinking to themselves, 
well, I'd like to paint, but I'm not as good as Jerry. I wouldn't be as talented. I haven't studied. And and so that might, uh, they might be afraid that they're not going to, it's not going to be good. And, and, and they're not going to uh, have something to present to people. So my question is, is there a level of talent that people need to have before they can uh, be in your group uh, and, uh, or, or really consider themselves an artist and be in the community? The answer to that is no. The answer to being in, the, in the, my critique group is that if, you get, if we find somebody that says, I need a critique group, and we as individuals feel We'll invite them on a trial basis. Say, "Will you come in and and then bring your uh, portfolio and let's talk?" And and uh, then it's a thumbs up or thumbs down, and they understand that they're being vetted. Uh, and you know, it's there's there are others. They don't like being rejected. Start your own critique group. I mean, you don't have to. We're not the end all. Crying out loud. So. Um, but the other thing about that, if you start comparing yourself with others, you know, the moment you start, comparison is the thief of joy. <laughs> Do you understand that? When you start comparing things, you are losing out big time. It is the thief of joy. So I'm not as good as you. Well, if I think that, I'm not. <laughs> So why would I want to think that in the first place? Get over it. If you want to paint, just paint. Ain't nothing to it but to do it. Good words to live by. I was a bad teacher once again because I did not see Joyce's hand up. Joyce is in Albuquerque, a city that I've spent a great deal of time in. Uh, Joyce, go ahead with your question. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't a question. It was just a comment about not knowing what someone else might see in your painting. That's a part of um, popular theory or, uh, of, in relation to fiction, to art, to any kind of prose. Um, you don't, it's, uh, once Robert Frost was asked what his painting, or no, what one of his poems meant, and what he said was, uh, um, well, when I wrote that poem, I only God and I knew what it meant, but now only God knows. Odd. Uh I'd like to bring attention to one slide. You see my oldest son in one of the slides. Behind him, above their fireplace, is the painting of the seal rock. So, hi, Blaine. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Blaine. Beautiful painting. Well, Jerry, this was so refreshing today. This is what we needed on a dreary winter day in Portland to have your spirit, to have your art uh, bring us up on this Sunday morning. This presentation was about so much more than art. It was about the human spirit and taking chances and enjoying life to the fullest. So thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you.